We're here with Fermin Fontanes. He's the executive director of the Puerto Rico Public Private Partnerships Authority. Thank you so much for, you know, being with us today and, and spending some of your time. We want to get right to it. Um, we want to talk about the P3 transactions that are in the pipeline. Um, I know there are several, but there are perhaps two or three that are right now in the running, right? So can you talk to us about what's going on? PREPA and the Maritime Authority are the two that I think are, are most pressing, right? Yes, yes. Well, good, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here today and, and to speak more about the different public-private partnerships that, that we have on the pipeline and obviously to clarify any doubts of the existing ones that, that we have already closed and, right. and where we're moving. Um, so obviously PREPA is, is the big one, the one that we have already closed and that we announced. Um, right, you announced the TND part, but there's another so, part running, yeah. the legacy generating um, equipment, right? So you tell me what you want to speak about first and I- Oh, I, no, no, I want to, the thing is that I think it's important to discuss perhaps what's in the pipeline because not everything has been said, right? I mean, I think the last thing that you would announced um, was that the RFQ for the legacy power generation asset yes. of the power company, okay. had, there, there was a, a, an interest. There were 10 companies that had you know, uh, expressed an interest. So I don't know if there's anything more that you could say about that. So, so let's talk about, I would say, the energy pipeline, pipeline first on, on the P3 so that we can go step by step Obviously, sure. we already announced the TND transaction. That is really, uh, you know, we had the third month, essentially, a anniversary, not anniversary, but the third month um, last week. Mm -hmm. So the transition is moving forward. Um, we expect co the full transition and commencement of operations to re for Luma to reach that date uh, about May or June of next year. Okay. Everything is going according to schedule, so if you know, unless there's any unexpected delays, we we assume that by June, Luma would have taken over the the T and D operations. And that so, was what eighteen months. Is that transition? How many months was that? They were supposed to be transitioning in, right? The the procurement process is the one that that we said eighteen months, but it's really it's really about it took us a bit. A bit more than two years okay to go from where we first began the process to actual signing on june 22nd um the actual i would say intense or or more complex part of the procurement lasted uh, around 18 months but okay. from us preparing the project and, and assembling the documents and, and going out to the market that's what took over two years the transition period, which is what began on June 22nd until um, commitments of operations, we saw, you know, this is not a turnkey type of contract where we hand over prep on day one. There has to be a lot of things that have to take place during the process. And that process began on June and it's supposed to last 11 months because okay. we want them to be on board by by May of next year, and I think and that's what I said is going according to schedule. Okay. The, the second component, I would say, of of the Act One Hundred and Twenty um, mandate to move Prepa into private hands is the generation component, which mm -hmm. is what we announced in August that we began the process of 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 the issuing the request for qualifications. Um, I think last week or two weeks ago, we announced that we had received more than 10. More than 10, right. More than 10 interested parties, which is a substantial amount, you know, world-class entities that are interested in operating the system. And I think in the next, Two weeks, we should be announcing the shortlist, okay. which are the numbers of participants from the, that, that submitted their SOQs that will go on to compete in the request for proposal stage. Do you know how, how short that shortlist will be? Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. 
we and and this is a I, I would say a good topic to discuss because I think it's also important for people to understand how this process work and and when we issue either the RFQ and the RFP, we we have already established what the evaluation criteria are going to be like. Mm -hmm. so, so the proponents that participate know what we are going to be looking at and what we're going to be evaluating. In the in, in the case of the RFQ, that is a public document; it's out there, so anybody that participates knows how that's going to work. So what we do now and what we're in the process of doing. Um, with our team of consultants is looking at what the people submitted, evaluating, and then we start scoring. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, what happens, and, and you know, I haven't been here forever, but in my experience with all of our projects, there's always a natural line that takes place that we don't really even have to enter in, into much of a discussion of who moves to the next stage. And by that, I mean, when we do the scoring, you would, you would, you know, here we have more than 10, but that's assuming we would get maybe 10, and this is obviously mm -hmm. an example, 10 that would score from 80 to 100, and then the remaining proponents score from 70 below. Mm -hmm. So we, that's, that's the natural cut line, and those are the ones that move to the next stage. Okay. Really, there's really not, not that much of a debate. There's rarely an instance when you are, there's, I would say, a confusion or, or a decision as to where you draw that line, because it usually occurs naturally. Some people do not comply with the financing component. Some people don't have the operating um, experience. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it just happens naturally, and, and which is good because for us, you know, it makes, makes it easy for you, right? <laughs> it, it, um, it makes it easy, it makes it transparent. You know, the record will show why we did it. And and in our experience as well, when we have somebody that's not sure listed that comes back to the table to look at at, at the decision making and, and the scoring, they usually go, you know, leave satisfied that everything was done mm -hmm. accordingly and, and that, that was just now, for the benefit of, of our viewers who may not be familiar with the second um, E3 proposal for PREPA, what are we talking about here? What are you looking for? And, and you know, what are they supposed to do as part of the agreement? Okay, so what we, we are essentially looking for also an operator to come in and operate and manage the um, PREPA, PREPA legacy assets generation fleet. Um, as you know, after Act 120 was passed in the legislature, um, Act 17 was passed about, I would say about a year later, which establishes the energy public policy for Puerto Rico, which sets very aggressive goals to move to renewables. So we were waiting for the IRP and that's one of the reasons why we had not issued this RFQ beforehand. But in essence, we needed to know what the existing lifeline of those legacy assets was, was going to be so that we could have a better picture of what we were looking for. Because originally when Act 120 was passed, the discussion was always, we're gonna sell the generation fleet. Right. Now that, that, that the public policy has moved to renewables, and renewable energy, then then we needed to to establish what the the timeline or the lifespan of, of the different legacy assets was going to be, mm -hmm. in accordance with the injection of renewables into the system. So, so basically, basically what we're talking about here is older power yeah, generating yeah. equipment that may or may not last x amount of years. Is, is that exactly exactly so? What we're looking is for one or more operators to come in and operate and maintain those assets until they're dismantled and taken out of the system in according to the IRP. So uh, as you are, and the IRP establishes a timeline as when each, each different, um, I would say, 
asset has to be removed, but that has to go in line with the injection of additional energy through renewables. So, and so how long, how long would this agreement be for? It doesn't sound like it, it's a long-term thing, right? I would say, well, I mean, there's, there's the, it would probably be around 10 to 15 years because yeah. if you look at the IRP, most, most of the legacy assets are scheduled to be turned off um, within the next 10, 15 years. Okay. That's all, but that also is going to depend on how quickly we can get the renewable energy into the system. We cannot turn uh, a power plant off if we don't have the, the renewable energy to substitute it. So that, that is essentially the, 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 I would say, the game we're playing is we are, we're moving for, the, for an operator that has to comply with what the IRP is saying, okay. but, but, but how fast they, will they do it? It's gonna depend on how quickly we can inject renewables into the system, which takes us, I would say, to our third phase, which will be starting the procurements for new renewable energy. Now, I, I, I have a question and I, I have a feeling many people have the same one. Um, why do we have to hire a third party to take care of this? Why can't PREPA just decide, okay, this doesn't work anymore, let's get rid of it. Why, why does a third party have to come in and do this? I love that question. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, I mean, we have all seen and we have experience, I would say, you know, in many aspects that, that PREPA has not been able to do this successfully. So, okay. um, well, that is the mandate of Act 120. So we're essentially that decision was made by the legislature and the governor when, when Act 120 was signed, that, that is that we had already lived through this experience and that we needed a change. Okay. And that change had to be um, I would say a dramatic one and that we were going to move to the operation of, of PREPA to private hands because of many multiple reasons, you know, the service quality that, that I think we all, we all lived and, and I always want to bring back the story to Hurricane Sirma Maria because when this determination was made by the legislature and the government, was right after the hurricanes hit Puerto Rico. We lost 100% of the power. Mm -hmm. This was a decision that was made in January of 2018 when we were still, most of the people in Puerto Rico were still without power more than six months or around six months after, after the hurricane. So mm -hmm. we, that, it was a deci decision that was made, essentially that, that this is not working. You know, there's, there's a $9.2 billion debt that you know, we have to assume the system is not where it should be. And are we gonna get the same people to get it there? Or are we gonna look for somebody else to help us? So it's really, it was a poly policy decision and we're following it. I think, you know, anybody that's questioning the decision has to really sit down and take the time and think about their quality of life, about what they lived after the hurricane, about the businesses, the people that, that were sick, the you know, the need. This is this is an essential service, mm -hmm. and we really can't be playing politics with an essential service that's meant to be something that you count on and you don't even think of when you are turning the light on or off. It should be automatic. You know, if if, if a storm is coming, you shouldn't be worried. You shouldn't be having to run to the store to buy diesel. You know. And you know, it shouldn't be the norm that everybody has a power generator in their home and, and things like that. So I think, you know, people have to, to step back a little bit and think, you know, there's a lot of controversy with these different issues, but we're really talking about more than 3.5 million people in Puerto Rico that suffer the consequences of, of an, a lack of administration, but a lack of managerial con continuity in that administration, because it's not, a political issue, it's not one party or the other, it's the lack of continuity in providing an essential service for the people of Puerto Rico. I think one example that I always use, and now it's gonna seem um, 
funny that I'm bringing it up because it just happened yesterday, but I always say, step back and think, Via Verde, Caso del Todo del Sur, Aguirre Gasport, all those failed efforts that change because there's no continue, con, because of the lack of, of, of continuity. Somebody comes in, has an idea, the other one comes in, changes that plan, the other one comes in and in the, in, in, throughout it, we already know because the, the report came out yesterday, but we spent close to $200 million in efforts that, that led to nothing and that not, not only is the amount of money, but the time. We're talking about 16, 14 years where really nothing happened in terms of, of generation. So now we know we're moving to renewables. We're going to give this to somebody that, that, that has the expertise and the experience. They're going to operate, come in, find the efficiencies, make the improvements that they need, but, but also be in charge of dismantling and, and taking care that 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 Older, uh, yeah. Now this is the second P3, right, under PREPA. When do you think this will be announced? Do you think it'll be ready before the elections? No, no, not at all. This this is we're just starting, so we'll announce the short this and after that we go into the request for proposal stage. This is probably something that won't get done until next year. And so how do you ensure continuity? Because you just mentioned the lack of. So if there's a new administration come in, coming in, how do you lock down, how do you lock them into continuing the process? Well, I mean, this is not only required by law, but it's a key, key it's a cornerstone of the fiscal plan. Okay. So the fiscal plan that obviously the, the uh, FOMB mm -hmm. certified has the transformation of PREPA as a cornerstone. It's a cornerstone not only for the fiscal plan, but for the economic development and the continuity in, in the future. So it is a requirement. It's not, I would say it's not optional. Obviously, anybody that can come in can pick up that fight if, if they would want to. My job right now is to comply mm -hmm. with what the law says and, and move things forward. And And whoever comes after me, then, you know, I would assume that they have the, the same responsibility that I have, so they have to to continue with it. But I think it's it's also important to understand that the credibility that we talked about the response on in in the process, you know, that P3 has a credibility in the market because of our past transactions, mm -hmm. but also it has gathered or increased the the credibility of Puerto Rico as a whole yeah. by, being able to, by being able to to complete these transactions among all the things that are going on. We have to remember that we're a PREPA is in Title Three, mm -hmm. that the government is is under PROMESA, that you know we suffered the hurricanes, that we we suffered through the summer of 2019, we suffered the earthquakes, yeah. and all through that we continued our path forward to try to complete these transactions and we were successful. So um, that has to carry a lot of weight for whoever comes in next. Um, because again, this is about the people of Puerto Rico and what we're doing is about providing better service to them in an essential service. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you can't, people cannot forget when we're having this discussion that PREPA was until we close this transaction and in a vertically integrated monopoly. But it's not also not only a monopoly, but it has a capture, it has a consumer base that's captured, that, that right. you don't have an option. Right. And still you are $9.2 million in debt. So, you know, I end the other day thinking about this, I, I was Googling examples of bankrupt monopolies and the only thing that I would come up every time was what happens when a player in monopoly goes bankrupt mm -hmm. so there's I couldn't find an example that was not based on the monopoly game right and then we're having this public discussion about aren't they the best person to handle this aren't they the best to handle the federal funding mm -hmm. I mean do we really want to to take that risk when it comes to an essential service 
that we all know, and I think nobody in Puerto Rico can argue that it's sufficient, that it's not normal there, there, that, that their body goes out every day. Despite that argument, however, there are people that will defend it and say that it's privatizing it or bringing in a private operator is not the right um, path to take. Um, and you know that there are many people um, that say that it's, you know, national or an island, uh, they say patrimonio, you know, patrimony, but um, I'm just wondering no, oh, to, to, how to much that, of that is true, you know? To, to that, I will, I will tell you this. The title remains in Puerto Rico. The beauty of this transaction is that it's a 15-year, when we talk about the TND, it's a 15-year contract. Luma Energy, let's put yeah, that. When we're talking about Luma, Luma comes in as the operator right. and man, the manager of the system. The system is still ours. We're just trusting somebody with the expertise and experience to take it to the level that we deserve. At the end of those 15 years, we have options. We can continue the contract. We could do a full concession as we did with the airport. We could take it back. But in the end, this is going to be a Puerto Rican company because Luma is a Puerto Rican company. Okay. And it's going to be filled up with Puerto Rican employees because they're going to hire um, the prep workforce and, and it's going to be people from Puerto Rico. So, you know, it's, it's, it will be uh, as Puerto Rican as many other companies like Banco Popular. It's just a part private company. But you know. Now, let, let's move on um, to the Maritime Transportation P3. That's also underway, right? Um, yes. Can you discuss um, where, what stage it's in and when do you foresee making an announcement as to who will be operating um, the ferry system? We're, we're finalizing negotiations um, with, with the preferred proponent. We are also go, um, entering into, into the approval process with, you know, in addition to our regular P3 process, because of the size of these contracts, we also need to get the approval of the Fiscal Oversight and Management Board. Okay. So we're working with them as well. Um, I cannot first tell, tell you exactly when that, that will take place because most we're at a stage where most of the, the timeline does not depend on us. But I do expect this to happen relatively soon. So that is, that is a, a project that we expect to complete prior to the, to the election. Okay, so for the benefit, again, for the benefit of our viewers, can you explain what you're looking for through that P3 agreement? Yes, we are also looking for somebody, and, and so let me step back before what I- What services I are gonna be offered, and you know, who are you looking for to do this? So we're looking for a private operator to come in and, and, and take over the ferry system for the municipalities of, of Vieques and Culebra, but also from San, San Juan Catania. Uh -huh. So um, in a sense, it, it's similar to, to the PREPA agreement, but um, it, this is different because as any transportation system in the world, the the maritime transportation system in Puerto Rico is a, it's a highly subsidized operation. So this is not this is not a piggy bank. This does not make any money. Um, um, to anybody who has um, ridden the, the ferries in the past, you know that the the price of the tickets are, are extremely cheap because it, it is a system that's designed really for the people of, of, of the citizens of, of, of the municipalities because this is their basic mode of transportation to come to work, to go to school, to go to the doctor. So it's a subsidized system. So what we're, we're looking in, into in terms, of, I would say, of the economics of, of the deal is to try to lower that, that subsidy that the government has to pay. This is not a concession like Metro Pistas mm -hmm. or the airport. Um, but we will be giving this to a private operator and then they are going to find the efficiencies in the system. They're going to find the, I would say, that sweet spot in terms of, 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 of the operation and, and we will save money in terms of, of the subsidy 
but it's still gonna be a, a subsidized operation. Obviously, we are protecting the the uh, the I would say the rates or the tariffs of the tickets for the for the citizens of the islands of Vieques and, and Culebra because this is not a mo money making operation. This is a service for the people of, of the islands of, of Vieques and Culebra. But again, we're, we're talking continuity. So non so wait a minute. So non residents will likely pay a different fee to be able to go to and from the islands of Puerto Rico. That that is correct, but that is an ongoing process that's really separate from from the B three. Okay. It's a, 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 a rate increase that that um, MTA is currently working on. They had public hearings and it's conducted in in accordance with FTA mm -hmm. Trans Transportation Authority's regulations. So this is a federally regulated operation. Right. So now let me ask you: um, you have already selected one preferred proponent that proponent would run both systems right both both ferry yes. systems okay yes. um are they aware of all of the challenges um that are associated with this um service and have they, have they at all told you how they propose to fix it or at least improve it yes of course um we, you know, it, it's it's always good to remind people that these are like in-depth processes that are robust, that take a long time. So this is not a, a direct contract negotiation that's done quickly. You know, we, it's, this process has been going on since the beginning of, of this administration. So it's taken almost three years Mm -hmm. get to where we are today so they have seen everything that's going on not only everything that has, has occurred media wise but also through the due diligence process and their site visits and and so they all all the proponents throughout the process have access to all this information so they know exactly what, what where the system is and when where we want to take it because we also have our requirements of what they we want them to do okay. and so when they send their proposals and during the contract negotiations you know we we have we have i would say um a program of of what how they propose to fix it and okay. when and how long it's going to take etc cetera, etc cetera. but um again this is this is a service that lacks the continuity you know, um, I I would point out that that these people are coming to operate the existing vessels, so we're yeah. not bringing yeah. in in new vessels. They're not. They're not bringing in new vessels. We're we're bringing in new vessels, but those vessels are being brought in through MTA and not through the proponent. So the uh -huh. proponent, if we were asking the proponent to include their own vessels or new vessels. Then the, the the price of the project and everything else would increase substantially and it wasn't feasible because that's really not what we're trying to do. Because although there's a lot of tourism on those vessels, it's an essential service for the people of Vieques and Culebra. And we, you know, works both ways, but the but our goal as government is to provide the service that the people need. Okay, wait. So how many new vessels are you bringing in and are you pulling out? the old existing ones are you replacing oh. or are you just adding so right now mta and this is the, this is not related to the p3 so uh -huh. I, I don't, but I don't, important though I, mean, I know i know i just want to separate mm -hmm. that those are efforts are are independent of each other uh -huh. the, the commitment of the private operator is going to be to take over the existing fleet whatever we provide them okay and then they're gonna be um, they they have to maintain them. They have to, you know, maintenance is huge in this operation. I mean, yeah. we have failed, or 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 the government has failed in providing the proper maintenance to these vessels. And there's multiple vessels that are always um, taken uh -huh. out, and and there's no vessels that that are, are ready to be substituted. So we're bringing somebody that does this. Um, in other in other places in the world and has that experience. 
okay. and, and you know, it's going to be on the hook under the contract to make sure that that doesn't happen, which is something that we don't have as government. Okay. Independently, there's there's a number of initiatives that MTA is taking. They they are bringing in um new new vessels that the proponent is going to be operating. They're they're also purchasing new okay. vessels. Okay, so how many? And just for the record, MTA is the Maritime Transportation Authority. Yes. So yes. That clear. So and, what are how, what are they bringing in, and when? Because this is important. I mean, people need to get around on these vessels. So. Yes, I don't know exactly when they're coming in. I know there's a vessel that's supposed to come sometime in October. The new the new vessels. I don't know the exact dates, but I think. What is important also in this conversation is that MTA, there's a lot of federal funds that are available for MTA that because of the lack of continuity in government, mm. we're, we were not availing ourselves of those funds. Okay. So we, there, there was a number of pockets of funds that, was, that were there that were not being used, but not only that, because of the misuse of those funds in the past, we had to regain that trust with 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 FTA, the Federal Transportation Authority, mm -hmm. to be able to access those funds, and that's what really has been taking place in the last two years, and and we are at that level where we are purchasing those vessels with federal funds. Okay. okay. So the way that we structure the agreement, it, it's similar to Prepa in that sense, that we can avail ourselves of the federal funds that are already there, but then we have a private party that's gonna operate them and maintain them and make sure that everything happens the way it is and that there's continuity in that process. So, so the ferries so, will be the ferries will be the gov government property, right? They'll remain actually, government the government ferries will property. be patrimonial. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you, how long um is that P three agreement for with the maritime uh that's a, that's a twenty three year agreement. Okay. And then um that's pretty long. Um yes. Again, that's pretty there, long. There is a reason, right? Is there a reason for that? That there there are multiple reasons because I think one those first three years are, are really going to be the years where they're going to be optimizing the operation and finding that that sweet spot to get to where we we want to go but i think also because it's a subsidized operation for this to to make sense not only the prop to the proponent but to the government in the financially it had to be it had to be that long okay. remember that we also we do we do a market sounding, but we also do our desirability and convenience study, and those were the the I would say. Um, Is that like a benchmark for this kind of a proposal? No, no, I wouldn't say the benchmark, but that that was really the the market's response or or or, or what the market was looking for if they were going to come in to take over this operation under these conditions with this amount of subsidy, that's really what they were looking for. So so we really tailored the agreement based on the market response to know how how much do we need and how far we can go. So and this is this is the same in our on, on most of our P3s is that we have to see what the market is willing to do and then how, how what are we willing to do on that and, and those and those are, are the numbers. Let me ask you, in that contract for the uh, ferry service, does that require adopting technology, being able to buy tickets online, being able to make reservations prior? Does yes. that require this operator to do that? Yes. And, as, and although MTA currently has, has a system for that, but the, these people are bringing their own system, which has been tested everywhere that they worked at. So, those are also the type of, of measures or improvements that we will see as customers, but most importantly, that bring the down the economics and 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 you know the yeah the costs pretty much the, right? the operation down because they are they already know what they need to do to get those savings to make to make this better. So 
that's really what we're counting for. All right. Is there another P3 ready to go? Or, I mean, I know you've talked about in, in prior interviews about student life. Um, there were a couple of buildings going up. Is there anything else moving forward right now? Well, yeah, I mean, we continue to move forward with um, a number of, of, of P3s. I mean, it's clear, it's clear that the pandemic has had an effect. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure of that, uh, right? That, that I was going to say student life, for example. Student life is one that, that we're still looking, but definitely the pandemic has had a, a huge impact in, in that um, social infrastructure type of P3s in the United States. I mean, the, particularly because the students are not back at, at, at right, school. Right. So we don't know when they're coming back. And, and and that is something that we're we're looking into because definitely the economics and everything changes and there's issues of risk that, that we have to evaluate not only us but also the the proponents the markets that who's who's willing to, to assume those risks at, at this stage now um, that project and I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt but let's just describe that project uh, briefly what was that project about that 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 project entailed really a student housing um, complex at the University of Maya which is a social infrastructure project is very common in in the United States and it's a it's really a growing industry um, where you, you really do just one housing they build operate um, finance and maintain and essentially they provide top-notch experience and so that's on hold right that was the next one that was that one was moving forward right is that on that, that one is moving forward I, I wouldn't say it's on hold right now i think we're just reevaluating the, the transaction based on the current um, COVID 19 situation and, and seeing what our options are okay. um but that, that it's it was an important pro it is an important project because the the university of maya west doesn't really have that availability for, for students, not only local students, but but also for students from abroad that could come in and stay within the campus. Sure. And and you know it's we call that student life because we also entailed other um other aspects. Other aspects. It's not just a dorm. It's it's a, a student center and like mm. you know you're trying to to increase that that um living experience in campus that in maya west it's really out in the town and i think we should note i mean the upr maya west is is a recruitment center pretty much for the major um yes. companies not only um on the local front but from everywhere in the world i mean it's a favorite of nasa so it definitely and, has its place right and and i think this this project would also help bring in students from abroad Mm -hmm. So have that experience. So I, you know, for I think it, obviously it's it, it was the, the. So when do you, think you when do you think you you know you revisit or or you know pick it up again? We are we are still in the, in those conversations. I think the COVID nineteen it's it's you know it it just throws everything out on the loop because we still like, we don't we don't have an end end in sight. Right. So we're still looking at the impacts and and when and how. This will be, we, I mean, we still don't know if kids are going to school in January, so. So it will be fair to say that perhaps the next, the incoming administration might have to. I would say, I would say yeah. that that would be fair to say that there's some certainty right now that, I mean, I don't, I don't foresee this happening in the next couple of months. Is there any other P3 proposal? Um, the, the, uh, the other one that, that I'm sure you know about is the maritime ports. The, the right. cruise ship ports. Um, that is something that was also thrown out on a loop because of the COVID-19, because we know that um, the cruise inter industry in particular has been impacted right. worldwide. Right. You know, there's really, there were no cruise lines out there until maybe a month ago, and there's still, we still don't know where that's gonna go and how how the market is going to react? Well, and that the one that and the one that's using Puerto Rico as home base said 2021. So, 
That one, I would say, is alive and well. Um, we are obviously renegotiating because the financials of the project have, have changed. We still don't have a visibility at what the market is going to look like. But I think, if anything, this pandemic has shown us or the industry is that privately operated ports have been more successful in, in, in both maintaining control over, over the pandemic, but also reopening. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I'll give you examples that during this whole time, you know, we could have been building the new ports where there's no chips there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, if we could have, I would say close this transaction prior to a pandemic, we would have had the advantage of having the next, the last eight months where we could have uh, built yeah, and could have operations. It. And that is happening in on other ports mm -hmm. and other islands in the Caribbean where they have privately operated ports. So, um, that that is something that 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 is also out there obviously we know that the cruise lines are not in the financial situation there were prior to I'm a pandemic will that change the scope of the project is what i'm wondering the, did it, you know will it change the the, the proposal itself you know uh, and how it was structured prior to the pandemic uh, and uh, and that's that's what we're working on that's what we're working on we're trying we're trying to to figure out how how are we going to move forward with the uncertainty in the market because this, the, the way the project was originally designed, we were you know, aiming at tripling the amount of, of passengers within about five years from when, from when we started mm -hmm. as we built up the, the infrastructure. Obviously, we still don't know if the market is going to recuperate to the to where it was, where it was right, right. in 2019, we all knew that the projects, projections were that they were this was going going to continue increasing. But we have to we have to get the sense of, of if that's going to happen. When are passengers going to feel more comfortable? Um, which um, cruise lines are going to be available? Which ones are going to be continue and uh, continue when? Mm -hmm. So. That's that's what we are finalizing, but it, but you know, yeah, it's it, it's a wait and see thing, right? I mean, because it, you know, you don't know how they'll what if if and when they'll bounce back. Um, and the cruise industry has been a lifeline for Puerto Rico, so it doesn't make it less important, right? I mean, I think no, not, I think if, if there were a need to reconfigure the project, would the P three authority be open to that? Of course, we we are. I mean, we are working on this and we're moving forward. So this is not, this, this negotiation is not in any means closed or ended or paused. We are actually addressing those issues in the contract to, to be able to, to feel comfortable both sides that, that, that you know, we, we can get a successful deal for them and for us and hopefully be ready for when the industry comes back we'll, we'll have an advantage which is what Wait, we want the proponent had been chosen already right we, we have a preferred proponent that we have been negotiating okay um and they haven't pulled out yet no okay no not at all which is great okay what's the name of that the, the company i cannot reveal the name oh. of the company ah, i thought it had been said it hadn't been said no no no, no. Ah, okay I that's the governor's job I see. No, I thought it had been revealed. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, listen, Mr. Fontanes, thank you so much for your time. Thank um, you. Sure, we'll speak again because these are ongoing um, transactions that are um, significant for Puerto Rico's economy, if not in the short run, then in the long term, right? For sure. Thank yeah. you very much for the opportunity, and I look forward to speaking to you again, hopefully with good news. More news. <laughs>